Welcome to the Faith Bible Church podcast. We hope the message you're about to hear is a blessing in your growth in Jesus Christ. We also pray that the message is not a substitute for your critical place in the local church and in community. Thanks again for joining us. I'd like to introduce you to two people. We'll call the first one Bruce. Bruce is a 48-year-old engineer, lives in our city. He's married, got three kids. He right now is sitting on the couch in his home. His kids are playing on the trampoline out the sliding glass door. His wife is reading at the dining room table with a cup of coffee. Bruce's life is really, really good. He's got a great job. His marriage is good. His kids are healthy. He's got two cars in the driveway that turn on every time he turns the key. His bank account is healthy. His job seems secure. And yet here is Bruce. Can you see him sitting on the couch? It's white linen, by the way. He's got his feet up and he's staring at a blank space in the wall right in front of him just zoned out, because of all of the beauty of his life and security, he is concentrating in this moment right now on a gaping hole in the middle of his life. He can't explain it. He doesn't have the words to describe it. You see, he doesn't often think of God or Jesus or the scriptures. In fact, the only time he can ever remember being in a building, gathering with people called the church, was maybe once or twice when he was a kid from his grandmother. His grandmother died when he was young, and so never really got to experience that again. As a military kid, he was moved all around, and his parents never talked about anything of God. They never prayed before meals, never mentioned the Bible never took him to a church, never talked about church camp or youth group or anything like that. He has no vocabulary, no context. And so as Bruce sits on his beautiful couch and stares at that blank space in the wall with the background noise of laughter of children, he doesn't understand, but he feels it. There is something missing in the middle of his life, and it's not small, it's huge. While every other detail would seem to make his life good, he knows that something big is missing and he feels empty. And again, he doesn't know how to describe it or explain it, doesn't even know who to ask, but he knows his neighbors. And there's something different about them. And Bruce lives next to you. I want to introduce you to Candace. Candace is a 27-year-old graphic designer and webmaster, and she loves her job. Her salary is rather meager, but her life is simple. She lives in an apartment in our city, on the north side of our city, and she enjoys her life. She's got a couple of good friends, three or four good friends, and they hang out together. Sometimes the friends come over to her apartment. Sometimes she goes over with them. Sometimes they go to happy hour, and they go to movies, and they go out to eat every once in a while. So she feels connected. She likes her job, generally. She's using her degree, even though she went to a Christian college, she studied IT and graphic design because she had no desire whatsoever to ever, ever have anything to do with the church again. You see, Candace's father used to be a pastor at a church, not the senior pastor, but one of the pastoral staff that often get looked over. They do all of the hard work in the background. They're constantly connecting and making decisions, but they don't have a lot of time on the stage. This is Candace's dad. Candace's dad is no longer a pastor. He's a financial advisor. And Candace's dad and her mom and her siblings, they don't go to church anymore either. You see, because Candace's father had a really hard exit from a large church in the South, and he felt crushed and his soul is fried. And he, yes, did it well as he left, and he hung around for a couple of months, but then very quickly after that, they just stopped showing up. That happened when Candace was young, and so she watched and assumed all of that pressure, and she attributed it 
to God and to the church. So she made the decision, 12 or 13, I want nothing to do with what my father did. And so she went to a Christian college. That's, that's what pastor's kids do. And so she decided to go there, but chapel was mandatory. She didn't enjoy it. She barely listened. She just turned her heart off. Intentionally so. She flipped the switch. Never went to church while she was in school. Graduated, moved to the woodlands to get this great job. And she thinks she's happy. But she knows there's something missing. She knows that there's an edge to her that she's got a large chip on her shoulder and she doesn't quite know the size of it. She doesn't know how it's affecting her, but it's, it's making her bitter. She's angry on the inside. She's struggling. But of course, she doesn't talk about that with her friends. She would rather not ever mention that or bring it up or ever even ask a question. And the beauty of Candace's story is she works just down the hallway from you. How might God be preparing you or already using you in the life of Bruce and Candace? What might he want to do through you into the life of an unchurched male with really, really good resume and credentials? But he has no concept. He's not anti-Christian or anti-Jesus He's just never been, doesn't know. But he is experiencing the weight of a life lived on his own, an eternity that's hanging with a question mark. How might God use you in the life of Candace, what we call a de-churched person because of pain and struggle and difficulty with Christians in the church? How might God use you to help restore her faith in God and attempt to take that terrifying first step back towards the church? You see, I want to talk to you from the scriptures about what God is calling us to do in the lives of Bruce's and Candace's all around. Because we're living in a city full of them, beautiful stories. More complicated, more gorgeous, and more horrific than even those stories and that we could possibly imagine. So we know what we do here. I mean, it's our mission statement. We'll talk about that. We build generations of Jesus followers, what we call disciples, followers of Jesus, who take grace to our world. That's what we do. But why do we do it? Why? That's a bigger question. Harder to answer. I can tell you how we do it. How we do that is faith path and community and all these things. What and how, simple, simpler than why. Why? Why do we do it? Well, the biblical answer is there, right? It's hanging over my right shoulder to glorify God. And that's true and beautiful. We should start with that. But I think for me, my prayer for us is I want us to experience the presence of God and the grace of God. And I want everyone to join us. I want to experience the power of the presence of God and the grace of God in my life. I want you to experience it in your life. And I want everyone else to join us. That's why we do what we do. And so I want to see together with you a beautiful narrative in the Gospel of Mark. So if you've got your Bibles, we'll be in the Gospel of Mark chapter 6. Um, we talked through the Gospel of Mark several years ago. It's called Follow Me, our series online. If you want a great study that can lead you through one of the Gospels, we have studied through all of the Gospel of John and all of the Gospel of Mark together. You can find those online, but we'll be in Mark chapter 6. And we want to see something incredible. Here's the setup. Jesus with his disciples, both the 12 men and undoubtedly some women, are in Nazareth, his boyhood town. And he finds himself in Nazareth, in the synagogue, and he's teaching. And yet the people don't receive it. They're like, hey, um, <clears throat> Ezekiel, talk with me for a second. That guy looks familiar. Wasn't he the pimply-faced kid that lived down the street a few years ago? 
And they're like, yeah, he was Joseph's son, the carpenter. He's like, well, so why, why is he talking so big now? Making all these big claims. Wow, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about this. You know, familiarity can be a great obstacle. And here in his boyhood town of Nazareth, Jesus says he wasn't able to do all that he wanted to do because of their lack of faith. He said a prophet has no honor, quoting the Old Testament, in his hometown. So at the end of that, beginning of verse 6, he left because of their unbelief. And then he began to travel, as he already was doing, in the villages around the Sea of Galilee, where Nazareth is. Not on the Sea of Galilee, but just over a mountain, down into a valley, Nazareth a very blue-collar town in Jesus' day, a stone quarry and carpenter's area. And Jesus operated around north-central Israel, around the Sea of Galilee, Galilee for years. His home base was Capernaum. Many of the cities to the right and left, east and west of Capernaum, were the hometowns of many of the disciples. And this is where he lived and moved and worked and ministered and preached and taught and healed and cast out demons. And then we get to verse 7 of Mark. I'll read it, and then we'll talk about it. Verse 7 of Mark, and he, that's Jesus, summoned the 12 and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits, and he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, but to wear sandals. And he added, do not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave town, any place that does not receive you or listen to you, as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. They went out and preached that men should repent, and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. And then on our screen at the end of verse 13, dot, 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 the little ellipse there leads into an interruption as Mark writes. And he does this intentionally. He stops there. Jesus calls the 12, summons them, and sends them out with instruction. As they go, dot, 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 pause there, Mark says. I want to flash back to John the Baptist. And I want to recount for you, for the first time in his gospel, the death of John the Baptist. Under evil Herod, out of jealousy and peer pressure, removed John's head from his body at a party. It is not a good story, but Mark inserts it right here as the 12 are going out as a flashback. It had already happened, and then he comes back to the story of the 12 in verse 30. That's where we'll pick it up. The apostles is one of the few times that the gospels narratives refer to the disciples, the 12, as apostles. The apostles gathered together with Jesus and then reported to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place, rest a while. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat, but they went away in a boat to a secluded place by themselves. A complete story of Jesus sending out the 12. They're obviously out for many days because they're staying with host families and then coming back. Right in the middle of the account, Mark interrupts himself with the flashback of the death of John the Baptist. Why would I bring this text up on a day like this when we want to talk about vision? Well, I'll explain it by looking at it once again. Go back to verse 7. What we see as Jesus sends out these 12, um, at least 12, um, is a collection of powerful truths and reminders for us. As we start a new semester, start a new school year, start a new, uh, I don't know, some of us are really trying to press that reset button really, really hard over the last 18 months. I'd really like to reset everything. Powerful reminder. So let's look at verse 7. He summoned the 12 and began to send them out. Let's just stop there, the first couple of words. So far in the Gospels, if you just rewind and read the beginning of Mark or the beginning of Matthew or Luke or even John, you know that it's quite dangerous and maybe a little foolhardy for Jesus to send the 12 out right now because they are a large mess. I mean, a hot mess, right? They are bickering with each other. They're not sure really who Jesus is. They don't know if they believe him when he says things. They are a mess. And yet here is Jesus saying, come to me, I'm going to send you out. That's a liability. Think about it. 
But it says something. It reminds us of something. It says this, that as Jesus sends us out, the priority is on the power of God working through them, not the prowess of the individual missionaries. It's not up to them. It's not up to their education or excellence or experience. He says, I'm calling you, I'm going to instruct you, and I'm going to send you out. And they are a hot mess. It's supposed to be a little shocking when we read it because Jesus is saying, I will go with you. All the things that I've called you to do, I will do through you in my power. And that's a reminder for us that as God calls us to new things, to the next things, We need to know that we come with messy hands, shaking hands, wounded and scarred hands. We come with gaps in our experience and knowledge. We come with relatively low to medium high wisdom and a lot of foolishness that we're still trying to put to bed. We come with all of that and God says, it's okay. It's okay. Because the weight of it all is resting on my power working through you not your prowess. And we see that as Jesus sends out the disciples. The next word is in pairs. He sent them out in pairs. And I love that because Jesus really says to them, hey, guys, I know that I operate alone, but you need to know I still talk about the Father and the Spirit all the time, so I'm not alone. I'm calling you to a similar community that I experience and enjoy in the Trinity. So I'm sending you out, listen, in the basic unit of community, a pair of people. It's a community. It's the basic unit of community. It's the starting point of community. But he says, you're not going out alone. You're going together for counsel, support, for backup, for all the good things that community provides. He says, I want you to go out together. I would love to know how he paired them off. Because I think that could be kind of fun, especially after watching The Chosen and getting a sense for at least some guy's idea of who these guys were. I would really like to know if Matthew went with Peter, really, because that would be amazing, okay? I really want to know, but he sent them out in pairs, and then it gets even better. Watch this. And he gave them authority. Now, we know from the scriptures and the gospels, Jesus has ultimate authority, over unclean spirits, demons, over disease, and even death. Jesus has authority. And he cannot transfer or give out authority that he doesn't have. So he gives them authority. He commissions them as ambassadors and representatives. That's what disciples of a rabbi were anyway. But he is exchanging the word disciple, which is learner, pupil, follower, and he's transitioning it to apostle one who is sent out as an ambassador and representative of the one who sends them. He gives them his authority. Now watch what his authority is directed at in this text. It's not, hey, I'm going to give you authority to teach excellent sermons or to answer hard questions with accurate truth or to sweep the floor and to bind uh, broken uh, you know, bones and to heal up sore wounds and to serve in my authority. Now, all of those things are probably included, but he specifies with an emphasis what his authority is. Watch. Gave them authority over the unclean spirits. That says something to us. It reminds us of something that is also true for us, just as much as it was true for the disciples, that their assignment is primarily a spiritual one. It operates in the spiritual realm and reality, and they will be opposed in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly places. That as God sends us out on assignments, that we enter a battle, a spiritual war. And if we forget that, we are easy casualties of that war. And so Jesus reminds his disciples and by way of them, us, that he gave authority, and he gave authority over unclean spirits. I think that's really, really important. Now, he gets specific, and he instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey. He actually says what to take, what not to take, and how to act when you get there. 
What are they supposed to take? Well, if you piece it all together, they're supposed to take one tunic, a belt, a staff, and sandals. What they are not supposed to take, if you piece it all together, is bread, a bag, money, and a second tunic. That's what he says. Hey, take nothing for your journey except a mere staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belt. But to wear sandals. And he adds, do not put on two tunics. Why this level of detail? Think about it for a second. Why this level of detail? I I think it, it reminds me of Gideon. Do you remember that story of Gideon? I love it. Judges chapter 7. The Amalekites and the Midianites are invading Israel. It says that their numbers in the valley were like locusts. All right? Gideon, Jeroboam, calls up the army of Israel. You know how many people show up? 32,000. I would say, yeah, sign me up for that. I'll lead an army of 32,000. What does God say? Sorry, buddy, it's too many. Excuse me? Like we're fighting locust army from two different nations against us, and there's too many? Yes. So he calls them, not once, not twice, several times. He gets down to this ridiculously low number. Remember? 300 men versus countless locust army. Why? Because God says, When you experience the victory that I have, I want you to remember it wasn't you, it was me. Seems to be the same thing. Jesus sends out the 12, don't carry with you an elaborate support system, which sounds quite wise to us, right? Fallback position, plan C and F, and extra money in the account, contingencies, backup, helicopter, whatever. And he says, no, sandals, one tunic, a staff, and a belt. The same exact thing, actually, that God told the Israelites to gather when they were leaving Egypt in the middle of the night in the Exodus. Same exact thing. And he says, do not take money, bread, an extra uh, tunic, or a bag to hold things in. Don't don't do it. You're going to trust God literally every step. You're going to trust me that I'm sending you out and equipping and providing you for you as you go. I think that's a good reminder for us. He also says how to act. Hey, whenever you enter a house, stay there till you leave. Any place that doesn't receive you or listen to you, shake off the dust from the soles of your feet as a testimony against him. This is what Jews would do when they left the land of Israel and came back into Israel from pagan Gentile land. When they got to that border, that imaginary line that separates one thing from another, um, they would get to this place and they would shake off the dust from their sandals So it is to not infect the holy land of Israel, Haaretz Israel. And he is asking Jewish disciples to do this in Jewish villages when they don't accept or listen. That's a powerful, powerful instruction. And it's heavy. It's hard. It would have been hard for a Jew to read about Jews going to other Jews. And it is shocking. And then verse 12, they went out and preached that men should repent. And they were casting out many demons, again, in the spiritual realm, and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. We get dot, 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 because now we go flashback to John the Baptist. Why would Mark plop right here the story of the death of John the Baptist? Well, for one simple reason. Jesus just sent out his disciples for the very first time, and he needs them to know and us reading the account that following Jesus will cost you your life. Following Jesus will cost you your life. Most of us, by God's great grace and the timing and the context of our culture, will probably not die as martyrs. Maybe not, I don't know. But following Jesus will cost you your life. Make no mistake, rejecting Jesus and hoarding your life will cost you much more. But following Jesus will cost you your life. And that's why Mark puts it right here. The cost of discipleship. And then we get to the following couple 
things, and I, I think there's at least one more thing to see in verse 30. The apostles gathered together with Jesus, and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. Jesus says, come away. Let's get to a secluded place. There's lots of people coming and going. You haven't even eaten yet. Come away. I think between the lines, Jesus says, I want to hear all these stories. Can you imagine the stories? I imagine there was some like, man, I tell you what, you wouldn't believe what happened when we went there. Like they were angry. They called us names. They kicked us out. They threw things at us. They would not let us in. They would not host us. You wouldn't believe it. Jesus like, really? I wouldn't believe that? You're saying to me? Saying that to me? And then others were like, man, we, we went into this house. They welcomed us. And, and the, the mother at this house, she was sick. She may have even been sick unto death. We don't know. But we gathered around her. We anointed her head with oil. We laid hands on her and prayed. And she got up. And the fever left her. And then we ate together. And we talked about you. It was amazing. And story after story after story. And what you see, if you can imagine that, is happening. Joy, pain shared. And what are they experiencing? But the very same thing that Jesus has done himself. And here's this beautiful thing. When they do what Jesus does, there's a beautiful connection and their intimacy grows. Can you see it? We have watched you, Jesus, do this very same thing through all of the village. We've watched you have hard times and beautiful times, and we've, ama- we've been amazed from the second row. But now we stepped into the field because you sent us out, and we experienced the same thing. And now, wow, we feel even more connected to you, even more a part of what you're doing. All of that is an incredible reminder to us and a protection to us. Um, If we can put a different grid and filter on this story, I'd like to examine four words that we use in pop culture because I think that we see them here. Those words are values or core values, mission, vision, and strategy. I think we see all that here. We want to talk about each of those words and then talk about what God has revealed for us in vision. First of all, values or core values is what people call them. I think this is the foundation of a group of people, of a family, of a church. It's the missional foundation. It really describes why we are who we are. Now, these men had values. It's not explicitly mentioned. But you know, because Jesus did it, and then he sent them out to do it, they valued the way that Jesus did it. They valued things like peace, truth, grace, the kingdom of God, the word of God repentance, the gospel. They valued that because Jesus valued that. And as they went out, don't you know, they, the chief thought on their mind was, I want to do this like I've watched Jesus do it. So they had values. We have values as a church. We have eight core values. They're amazing and beautiful and perfectly describe why we are who we are. Now, values give way to mission. Mission is a word that is variously defined and interpreted. I'm going to define it as an identity kind of thing. It is really why we are here, why we exist, why God has created this collection of people on a journey together with Jesus. Now, our mission statement is very simple. We build generations of Jesus followers who take grace to our world. That's why we exist. That's our identity our missional identity. Now, their mission was pretty simple. They go out to represent Jesus. Jesus gave them authority, told them what to do. Okay, I'm stepping out. I know that when I step out and go, you're not coming with me, but I'm representing you. I'm an ambassador representative. I've transitioned from disciple to apostle, and here I go. That was their mission. Now, the vision is more specific. It's within the mission, built on the foundation of the values, very specific now, what God is calling you to do next. You do this vision work every time you discuss family vacation. And you say, hey, you want to take vacation next year? Yeah, yeah, where are you going to go? Well, option one, Disneyland. Option two, beach. Option three, mountains. Option four, family. Let's kill option four. Okay, so Disney, (laughs) beach, mountains. Where are we going to do? So we throw, where where are we going to go next? 
Where are we going to go next? And you begin to talk and pray and look at your finances and maybe pull your kids if you're dangerous. You do that. And so you, you try to determine where we're headed next. And that's what really what vision, vision is. It's a, it's a missional purpose. It's where are we going next? And that is specific. Jesus said to the 12, hey, in these villages right here, in these villages right here over the next couple of weeks is where I want you to go, all right? And he tells them specifically what he wants them to do. Now, how they do it, what to take, what not to take, how to act, that's called strategy or action plans. It's missional tactics. It's how we do these things. All of these things are really visible here. It's beautiful. Now, if we take that third word, vision, and we expand it out, I'd like to tell you the vision that God has called us to over the next years. This is not my definition of vision, but it's a good one, and I fail to remember how to and who to attribute this to. But vision, as I always recall it, is burden plus intent. I think it's really good. Vision begins with a burden, and a vision for a church begins with a God-sent, Jesus-centered burden. Maybe it's for the Bruces and the Candaces of the world. Maybe it's for the Christian follower of Jesus who has been to hell and back, this side of heaven, and is still struggling with healing and understanding how to put one foot in front of the other and how to get out of bed tomorrow. Maybe it's for that young family or the single individual or the student in college who loves Jesus but doesn't know how quite to take the next step. It's a burden, plus an intention to meet God in that burden. And I want to talk to you about four things that God has really given us to put our hands and feet and heart to over the next several years. I want to start backwards, okay? So point four of our vision, what we're calling Faith Bible Next, is we feel strongly that God wants to multiply the uniqueness of the DNA of Faith Bible Church outward. And I'll be really frank and honest with you, as I always am at this point, to tell you the elders and I and our pastors and staff, we have no real idea what that looks like yet. We don't know if that means a church plant, a multi-site, or any of the other options that are out there. We really don't know. But we do feel strongly that God is calling us outward to expand and multiply. I feel personally, as vision is really my charge, um, to hear from God, to pray, and then to bring that to our elders and our staff. And as we work in groups over the months, begin to clarify the way God is leading. I believe that it is responsibility of every healthy church to multiply. I see that in the Gospels, uh, excuse me, in the, in the book of Acts after the Gospels. I see that in the rest of the New Testament. And we feel strongly that God is calling us out. This is going to take years, listen, years of prayer, preparation, investigation, and community work. It's not going to happen quickly. And we have a lot of work to do to figure out how God clarifies his calling on that. That's point four. That is the largest concentric circle. So we're going to work backwards to point three, and this becomes a burden for our city. We feel God is calling us as more robustly than ever before, and we've been doing this for many, many years, decades actually, to saturate our city with incarnate grace and truth in the gospel of Jesus, to meet the needs of our city. Imagine this for a second. If God decided to do a very specific rapture and just take all of the Faith Bible Church family out, okay? It's not biblical. It's not going to happen that way, by the way. But just imagine. He said, ah, Faith Bible Church, boom. Enoch, Elijah, I'm going to bring you up with me. We all disappear from our homes, from our cars, from our offices. Would the city that we live in notice Think about it. Would they miss us? Would your neighbors, your coworkers, your baristas and checkout folks at the restaurants and markets, would they miss you? I hope they would. Otherwise, what are we doing? If we're not making an impact with our presence, representing Jesus, wherever we go, what are we doing? And so, 
God has really called us to more robustly than ever focus on that. That's gonna happen with a lot of collaboration with other churches, other mission organizations and ministries in our city, and we are fully, fully excited to take this vision down to the level of strategy and action plan and bring that to you because this, I don't know if you can already tell, this is going to require the entire church family. This cannot be done by me or a team of elders or pastors. It can't be done by the same 75 people that always show up at everything. It has to be done by all of us, and this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. That leads to another concentric circle of two. More than ever before, we want to pull, uh, pour our hearts into developing leaders in our church, to create a culture and a pipeline for leadership development. Now, we have been developing leaders. We want to do this in a more systematic and robust way than ever before. We want folks to know, after years of work, that Faith Bible Church is the place to go if you want to be a trained leader. If you are thinking about going into ministry in any way, you know what? Faith Bible Church would be a great place to go and get trained. If you want to be a lay teacher, you're an engineer or a stay-at-home dad or mom, but you feel called by God to teach the Bible, Faith Bible Church is a great place to go to get trained. If you want to be a missionary, Faith Bible Church would be a great place to go to get trained in diverse areas, attributing to every one of the spiritual gifts and all that God would have us do. We've got an incredible, incredible joy when we think about how that will work. Now, the Empower Leadership Summit is just the first step. We're gonna take this strategically and systematically, but over the next many years, we hope to have an incredibly robust leadership development program, at least the start of things. We are excited. Now, that leads back to one. This is where the rock drops in the water and the ripples begin to come out. And this has everything to do with a culture of trust and health among the highest levels of leaders in our church. And if you read that, you might think to yourself, well, Scott, is, if that's on the um, vision list, are there, are there some big fires among our leaders? Like, what's going on? Are there problems? Um, no, there are not big fires among our leaders. And this appears there because God has burdened us with it, primarily because of this. I don't know if you've been noticing, but the church is under attack. A primary position of attack, point of attack, is leaders. Leaders' hearts, leaders' secrets, and leadership relationships. And we would feel like the other three points would leave a gaping hole if we didn't ensure that the health and trust we already enjoy as leaders isn't uh, fortified and deepened and grown with resilient and persevering, enduring attention to developing and ensuring and deepening that trust and health among leaders. We want to shore up the place of common attack from the enemy. And that, again, you work backwards now, trust at high levels, expand it out to more and more leaders of trust and health at high levels, to saturate our city and to multiply our ex a beautiful um, DNA that God has given us, is a thrilling thrilling picture, in my opinion, of what God has called us to do. There is a, invariably, it must be ancient, because I don't know any s contemporary scenario where this would work, but um, an ancient parable is a guy walking by people who are making bricks, stamping earth and clay and straw together into molds, and three men are making bricks in a line, and the guy walking by says to the first one, what are you doing? And he looks up with bewilderment, I'm making bricks, duh, right? He steps over a little bit more to the second guy, what are you doing? Oh, I'm building a wall that will protect a city. Okay, to the third guy, making bricks, what are you doing? Oh, I'm building a cathedral, and it's going to be the most beautiful cathedral in the world. You see, there's a big difference between thinking the work that we're doing is just bricks and understanding how the bricks fit into God's plan for us as a family, where he's taking us next. Here's the big idea, and I would really love to respond in worship with you. Um, the big idea is this, to do a great work through us, Jesus first wants to do a great work in us. You see, all of these plans have one starting point, and it's not activity with your hands. 
I want you to hear me. All of these great plans that I just talked that God has delivered to us has a starting point, and it's not the activity of your hands. It's in your heart. The starting point and place is your heart, what God wants to do in you and how he wants to include you in this. There is no one, no age, no story left out of God's plan for what's next for our church family. 